Welcome to this seminar. We're going to be exploring the relationship between Israel and the church. And we're going to consider uh, seven of the most popular assumptions made about this relationship. And they're based on my book, Zion's Christian Soldiers, which you can access online uh, either as a Kindle book uh, or if you go to my website, stephensizer.com, you can access the, uh, the chapters of the book. Uh, there is also available a PDF of, an, uh, of a summary of this presentation, um, which explores uh, what the Bible has to say about the relationship between Israel and the church. And I, I encourage you to download that to uh, make the most of this presentation. We're going to be looking at seven of the most common assumptions made about the relationship between Israel and the church. And we're going to, in a sense, uh, give them uh, the biblical test. Here are the seven. The first is that God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel. The second is that the Jewish people are God's chosen people. Third, that the promised land was given by God to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. Fourth, that Jerusalem is the exclusive and undivided eternal capital of the Jewish people. Fifth, the Jewish temple must be rebuilt before Jesus returns. Six, that believers will soon be raptured to heaven before the end time battle of Armageddon. And seventh, that God has a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. So we're gonna look at these seven common assumptions. Now I liken them to a balloon of hot air. Uh, how many pins do you need to burst a balloon? Well, I'm going to give you seven. We're going to look at seven biblical answers to these uh, common assumptions. The first is that God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who curse Israel. And this is based on a promise God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. A couple of observations we can make. First of all, that this was a promise God made to Abraham and no one else. There is nothing in the text that assumes it would apply to anyone else. And secondly, uh, there is uh, certainly nothing to suggest that the passage applies in perpetuity. Uh, or unconditionally to Abraham's physical descendants. Now, in a, a later passage in Genesis 22, uh, God says to Abraham, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore, and through your seed all nations on earth will be blessed. Now, this is the promise that is often used uh, to suggest that uh, God's blessing upon our world today comes through at supporting and blessing Israel. But it's very important when we uh, look at scripture to allow scripture to interpret scripture, especially where uh, a passage of scripture uh, makes clear what another uh, means or how it should be interpreted. Uh, and this is a good example. Uh, we look at that word seed. How is the word seed used in the Bible? Well, the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 is very explicit. He says the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. So we cannot go back and uh, read that word seed to mean the Jewish people when the Apostle Paul has said, it means Jesus. You see, the flow of biblical history is one way. If I had a can of, 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 of Coke and a can of Sprite, and the Sprite stood for um, uh, Abraham's physical descendants, and uh, the Coke stood for um, his spiritual descendants, if I mix the two together, you cannot go back to Sprite. 
And the Apostle Paul goes on, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the promise God made to Abraham is applied to all who trust in and through his seed, which is Jesus. We're used to reading the Bible historically or chronologically, but what the New Testament says, particularly Jesus himself, is that the scriptures are about himself. When Jesus was debating uh, the Pharisees in John chapter 5, he says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. He's saying the Hebrew scriptures are testifying about me. So as we read the Hebrew scriptures, we need to interpret them and see them through the grid of the New Testament, not as if the coming of Jesus had never happened. On the road to Emmaus, when Jesus uh, is, has encountered two of his followers, they haven't recognized him yet. And uh, they're downcast, discouraged, and in the conversation, he says, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explains to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So from Genesis through to Zechariah, Jesus gave them a Bible study to show that the scriptures are pointing to himself. God's blessing is for the whole world, and it is only through Jesus. I think we burst that one. Let's look at the second one. The second assumption is that the Jewish people are God's chosen people. Uh, the uh, Hebrew and Christian scriptures repeatedly insist that membership of God's people have always been open to all races on the basis of grace, not race. Let me give you a few examples. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, God says, don't despise an Edomite, for the Edomites are related to you. Do not despise an Egyptian, because you resided as foreigners in their country. The third generation of children born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. He's saying that foreigners who recognize God and worship him must be welcomed into the people of God. This is even more explicitly stated in the prophets, Isaiah 56, for example. God says, let no foreigners who've bound themselves to the Lord say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Now just think about that verse. Who said it? The Lord said it. And if the Lord said, let no foreigners who bound themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people, why would foreigners say it if God didn't want them to say it? The reason they must have said it was because the Lord's people were doing the excluding. They were excluding the foreigners. So God says, Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. See, that's why Jesus got angry in the temple. When he saw the market traders blocking the court of the Gentiles so that the foreigners, the Gentiles, could not worship the one true God, he overturned the money changers. He, he made a whip and he cast them out of the temple. And he quotes this passage. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. You see, God's people always were intended to be inclusive. Now, I'm sure you know the story of Esther. Uh, but you may not be aware of what happened right at the end of the story. Um, Esther 8 verse 17 says, In every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating. And that's the basis of uh, the Feast of Purim 
which is still celebrated today, how God delivered his people from their enemies. But that's only half the verse. The rest of the verse goes on to say, and many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Now, how many is other nationalities? Well, it's more than one. And how many is many people? It means that from the time of Esther on, the people of God was made up of many nationalities, many people, many people who were not descended from Abraham, but they were considered Jews. See, in the Old Testament, God's people were inclusive, and we find exactly the same in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, sorry, uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 8 uh, is in, encountering some opposition to his message, particularly from the religious leaders. And he warns them, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place in the feast of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the East and the West were not the Jewish diaspora. They were the Gentile nations. He contrasts the Gentiles who will be welcomed and the subjects of the kingdom who will be thrown out on the basis of how they respond to Jesus. The Apostle Paul in Romans 2 helps us understand what that word Jew means. He says, a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. So the word Jew is meant to be understood in spiritual terms, not only physical. And he does the same in Romans 9 with the word Israel. He says, quote, it is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. No, because they are his descendants, are they all Abraham's children? On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. See what he's saying? He's saying that there is physical Israel, the descendants of Abraham, and then there is a spiritual Israel who are the true children of the promise. They are Abraham's offspring because they have the faith of Abraham. In Galatians chapter four, Paul develops this idea that he's, uh, that he's introduced in Romans uh, in a very simple way. Uh, we tend to assume that uh, the Jewish people today are descended from Isaac through Sarah, and the Arabs are descended from uh, Ishmael, uh, from his mother, Hagar. But what he does is Paul reverses the blessing. He says that Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. He's saying in Jerusalem, they've rejected Jesus. They are the children of Hagar. The Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother, our, meaning Paul and the Galatians. And if that is not explicit, uh, in the very next verse it is. He says, now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. So he reverses the blessing. He says that Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus are the spiritual descendants of Isaac and Sarah. And he goes one step further, because in verse 30 of Galatians 4, he quotes the very words of Sarah to Abraham. Sarah said, get rid of Hagar. You cannot, we cannot live under the same roof. Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. And then Paul uh, 
Paul applies that. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. You see, you cannot mix law and grace. You cannot mix law and grace. The word chosen in the New Testament is only ever used of the followers of Jesus. Not once is it used of the Jewish people. In Colossians 3, Paul says, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You see, the followers of Jesus are God's chosen people of all nationalities. Well, I think we've burst that one too. What about the land? The assumption is often made that the promised land was given by God to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. And this is a, a core principle of Zionism today and why many Christians support uh, Israel's uh, annexation of the land on which the Palestinians live. It goes back to a promise God made to Abraham in Genesis 15. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. And this is a, a map of how that verse is understood historically, particularly in the time of uh, Theodore Herzl, from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. That was the land uh, that many Zionists believe God mandated for his Jewish people. But they make a simple but a profound error. And that is that the land belongs to God. In Leviticus 25, God says the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Now, how do we marry these two concepts? God gave the land to Abraham and his descendants in perpetuity, but God says the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. Well, the simplest way to understand this is the difference between freehold and leasehold. If you're buying a property and you're spending a lot of money, you have to make sure whether you are buying freehold or leasehold. Freehold means that you're buying the house and the land on which the house is built. Leasehold says you're buying the house, but you will be renting the land on which your house is built. The Jews thought that they were getting freehold. God was telling them, you're getting leasehold. You get to live in my land. I'm giving you this land, but it belongs to me. And you are foreigners and strangers. In uh, Ezekiel 33, this is made quite explicit. Um, God is having a conversation with Ezekiel and God says this, son of man, the people living in those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he possessed the land. But we are many. Sure, the land has been given to us as our possession. Might is right. No. Notice what God says in the next verse. Therefore say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it, you look to your idols and shed blood, should you possess the land? You rely on your sword, you do detestable things, should you then possess the land? I will make the land a desolate waste and your proud strength will come to an end. Wow. Residence in God's land was open to all God's people on the basis of faith, not race. Indeed, the land was to be shared. A little later in Ezekiel 47, God says, you are to distribute this land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. You are to allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the foreigners residing among you who have children. You are to consider them as native born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe a foreigner resides, there you are to give them their inheritance. Now notice in three verses, God says three times, share the inheritance with the foreigners. 
Now, when God says something once in Scripture, it's true. When he says it twice in two verses, it must be important. But why would he say it three times in three verses? Simple answer. Because they didn't want to share the land. The New Testament helps us understand the place of the land. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith, uh, Abraham made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what was promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. You see, the land was never intended to be their final destination. It was a temporary residence. As it said, uh, you are aliens and strangers. See, I liken the land to a runway, an airport. The land was there to bring God's redemptive plan to fruition in Jesus Christ. And then Jesus uh, commissions his apostles to take the good news of the message of the gospel out to the world, to turn their backs on Jerusalem and the land. They are never told to come back. The land has fulfilled its purpose. I think we've burst that one too. Fourth, Jerusalem is the exclusive and undivided eternal capital of the Jewish people. Well, this uh, assumption goes hand in hand with the, uh, the third about the land itself. Uh, ironically, uh, there is no basis whatsoever in scripture for this assumption. Let's just look at one passage. Uh, Psalm 87, for example, verses four to six. God says, I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me, Philistia too, and Tyre, along with Cush, and will say, this one was born in Zion. And indeed of Zion, it will be said, this one and that one was born in her, and the Most High will establish her. The Lord will write in the register of the peoples, this one was born in Zion. Now, uh, Rahab is uh, Egypt today, Babylon is Iraq, Philistia, that's uh, uh, Palestinians perhaps, or Tyre is certainly Lebanon, Cush is Africa. But notice God says three times in three verses, the foreigners were born in Zion. Now, if you're born somewhere, what do you get? You normally get a passport. You get citizenship. God is saying three times in three verses, the foreigners who recognize me, it is as if they were born in Zion. The land, Jerusalem, was to be shared. When we come to the New Testament, we see that Jerusalem is under judgment. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets. You stone those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen, ga a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you are not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Again, Luke 19, he warned, if, if you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come when, you, when your enemies will surround you. They'll encircle you and hem you on every side. They will dash you to the ground. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You see, the, the judgment of Jerusalem was fulfilled in AD 70 when the city was destroyed and its people were exiled in slavery. As the New Testament progresses, we find a different Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem described. Indeed, in Hebrews 12, the apostle says, you have come to Mount Zion. You've already gained citizenship of 
Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. And in Revelation 21, we have this beautiful picture of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. This is the Jerusalem that uh, uh, we need to focus on, not the physical earthly city. It's a city that should be shared, not uh, a city that it can be claimed exclusively by one people. I think we burst that one too. Fifthly, the Jewish temple must be rebuilt before Jesus returns. Prophecy watchers like to quote from Daniel 9 and Matthew 24 to suggest that a future temple must be built and desecrated by the Antichrist before Jesus can return to set up his kingdom. And uh, this is one of the passages often cited um, to, uh, to justify this uh, belief. Uh, Daniel 9 says, the people of the ruler will come, will destroy the city and sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, we're on earth in this passage. It is there the idea that the temple has to be rebuilt? The temple was destroyed in AD 70. Uh, where, where in this passage does it suggest that it has to be rebuilt? Well, what our friends do to justify this belief is that they split the passage in two and they add a 2,000 year parenthesis. They say that verse 26 is describing the temple that was destroyed uh, by the Romans in AD 70, uh, but they say, how can you desecrate a temple that's already been destroyed? Answer, you need a new temple. So they believe that verse 27 is talking about a future temple. Even though Josephus and other writers describe the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70 as the fulfillment of this passage. No, in the New Testament, we find the temple is under construction. In John chapter 2, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. And they replied, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he'd spoken of was his body. You see, the Old Testament temple was only ever intended to be a temporary building through which God would encounter his people we discover in the New Testament that Jesus would be the mediator, not a building. Indeed, uh, the epistles look back to the coming of Jesus, his death and his resurrection, and explain that the church, the people, have become the temple. Paul in Ephesians 2 says, uh, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Again, 1 Peter says, like living stones, you are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jewish temple must be rebuilt? No way. What about six? Believers will soon be raptured to heaven before the end time battle of Armageddon. This uh, is a very popular concept uh, among uh, uh, evangelicals particularly. But the reality is there'll be no secret rapture. Uh, the, 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 the New Testament is emphatic that uh, the return of Jesus will be audible, visible, and unmistakable. We see this in Matthew 24. All peoples on earth will see the coming of the Son of Man. With a loud trumpet call, God will gather his elect from the four winds. No secret rapture. The rapture is about the return of Jesus. It will be at the end of time, and all peoples on earth will see it. And Paul in Thessalonians says exactly the same thing. There will be a loud command, the voice of the archangel, and trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, after that, we who are still alive will be caught, who are left will be caught up together to be with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and we will be with the Lord forever. So no secret rapture. But what about this concept of being left behind? Do you want to be left behind? Well, the idea is taken from um, this passage in Matthew 24, where Jesus says two men will be in a field, one will be taken, one left behind. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken, one left behind. Well, the question is, do you want to be taken or do you want to be left behind? Which is it going to be? Are you going to uh, determine your eternal destiny on the flip of a coin? I think we need a little bit more um, assurance as to which is which. And again, in terms of um, biblical interpretation, if you've got a verse like this that is a little ambiguous, where do you go to make sense of it? You don't flip to Revelation or Genesis. You look in the immediately preceding verses. And what do we find in verse 38 and 39? 37 to 39. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Who was taken? That is how it will be, says Jesus, at the coming of the Son of Man. Who was taken? It was the people who were eating and drinking, giving and receiving in marriage, who knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in a field and one will be taken and one left. You see, it was Noah and his family that were left in the ark. They were safe. It was those who'd rejected the message of God who were taken away. And that's what it will be like at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus in Matthew 13 says exactly the same thing. In another of his parables, he talks about the, uh, the harvest. And he says um, that uh, in this parable, uh, some enemies had sown tares in the wheat and the workers come to the owner and says, shall we pull the, the tares up? He says, no, wait, let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So which is taken first? It's the weeds. And if you've got a, 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 a Schofield reference Bible, have a look at this verse and look at Schofield's footnote. And in his footnote, he contradicts scripture. He says, it will be the wheat that will be taken first. It's not what the verse says. So do you want to be left behind? Or do you want to be taken? I want to be left behind when Jesus returns. No, the New Testament emphasis is not that the world's going to be nuked in an Armageddon scenario. Right at the end of the Bible, in Revelation 22, we have this future portrayed. The angel showed me the river of water of life, clear as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down to the middle of the great river street in the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Did you see that? The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The nations haven't been nuked. The nations are there and they are being healed, reconciled, united in Christ. That is our calling as followers to be ministers of reconciliation, not confrontation. We're called to be peacemakers, not widow makers. We burst that one too, I think. And finally, common assumption is that God has a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. Well, let's look at this. The reality is that God has only ever had one inclusive people. What I've done in this picture is uh, drawn together, synthesized two passages, John 15 and Romans 11, the idea of the vine and the branches and the wild and the natural branches of the olive tree. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, and we need to remain in him if we are to bear fruit. Again, in Romans 11, we see the wild branches grafted in 
to the natural branches. But it begs the question, Romans 11, as, as Gentiles, we have been grafted in among the others and share in the nourishing sap of the olive root. Well, if Gentiles have been grafted in, into what have we been grafted? We've been grafted into Israel. I've shown you that all the way through this presentation. The people of God from Genesis on has been an inclusive people of God. The Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 2. He talks about the Gentiles. He says, remember that formerly you Gentiles by birth called uncircumcised by those who were, uh, call themselves a circumcision. Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners of the covenant of the promise, without hope, without God. But, and the key word is that word, but, now in Christ Jesus, you who are far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. The question here is, does God have one people or two? One or two? I think this passage answers it very, very clearly. I liken the, the history of God's redemptive purposes from the promises of Abraham through to uh, the book of Revelation. God promised Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And in Revelation 7, we find this great multitude of every language, tribe, and nation in heaven. How do we get there? Well, think of the hourglass or the egg timer. Uh, the promises of Abraham are fulfilled through the remnant uh, of Judah, um, through the remnant of the exiles who return to the land, and then we meet Jesus. My reading of Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Christ died on the cross, he was Israel. He was the seed. There was no one else. Who was there? Who was the faithful remnant? At the cross, there was Mary, there was the mother of Jesus, and John. But respectfully, were they singing the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of, Prince of Glory died? My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride? No, they were weeping because they didn't understand why Christ died. So when Christ died on the cross, he was Israel. But then as he uh, restores his disciples, he forgives them and uh, he fills, he, he, he breathes on them with the Holy Spirit. He empowers them, commissions them, and sends them out. We find God's people uh, in Acts chapter 2, for example, made up of many nationalities who hear the word of God and repent and believe. And so that's how we reach the great multitude. It is through faith in Jesus. The promises of the Old Testament are only fulfilled in and through Jesus. One last passage to think about. Ephesians 3. The mystery of Christ, which was not made known to peoples in other generations, as it's been revealed by the spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. One people of God, Jews and Gentiles, one body. So God does not have a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. Yes, he wants to bring back the natural branches and graft them back into the vine, into the olive tree, but it will only be through faith in their, their Messiah, Jesus Christ. We've looked at seven of the most popular assumptions made uh, about the relationship between Israel and the church. And I hope you've uh, begun to understand how they are fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ. Two questions to leave you. Was the coming of Jesus the fulfillment or the postponement of the promises God made to Abraham? And does God have one people 
or two. Please have a look at the summary. It contains all the passages uh, we've looked at and also a helpful chart comparing how uh, the term Israel uh, is used in the Old Testament and how the same word is used in the New. As I said, you can access uh, much more information on this presentation uh, from my book, Science Christian Soldiers, available in Kindle format, and the text is there on my website, stephensizer.com. And if you're curious about the historical roots of Christian Zionism or its political agenda, its very destructive apocalyptic agenda, again, you'll find more information uh, through my book, uh, Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon. Again, that's available on my website. And if you're curious about my ministry now, then I, I commend to you our charity, peacemakers.ngo, where you'll find out more about how we're seeking to be catalysts for peacemaking, where minorities are persecuted, justice is denied, human rights are suppressed, or reconciliation is needed. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you.